they have a wave offering. Okay? Uh, can we do a wave offering and do it one side and then the, or go across? And we'll start over there. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Is that simple enough? Let's try it. Over here. He is risen. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Now, can you raise your hands and talk at the same time? Okay, let's do it one more time. Over here. He, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Wow. I'm going to take you to a storm baseball game. What a great day to worship. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, I serve a risen Savior. And he is living in my heart this morning. Go ahead and say it. I said to tell your neighbor, I serve a risen Savior. Did you remember that? Oh, the rest of it is, Jesus Christ is my living hope. All right, you're catching on this morning. Well, now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we prepare our hearts, remember today, God gave us a second chance, the resurrection of his son. During his final hours, prayer was on the mind of Christ. He reminded his disciples to pray lest they enter into temptation. And so this morning we go to prayer on this Easter morning, knowing that the power of prayer and break every chain and set the prisoner free. What is the prayer of your heart this morning? Do you need to cast every care upon him? He's able to lift your burden and give you peace and comfort in the midst of every storm or season in your life. Join me as we humbly approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Father, may your glory shine down upon us today. Bring comfort and strength to all who are facing health issues and various concerns. And may we have a fresh awareness of your abiding presence, I pray. Father, we celebrate the victory of the empty tomb. We celebrate the hope of eternal life with Jesus after death. We celebrate as did Paul when he wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, we intercede this morning for the needs of your people in Haiti. Bring order and peace and protection to those who are suffering at the hands of evil men. Be with your church and leaders who are asking their lives, who are, who are risking their lives to give out the gospel in various ways of compassionate ministries. May this be a day when many will turn to Christ and find that he is the hope of the world. Have mercy upon America this morning, and the unfolding of your sovereign will be done. May the signs of the times keep us awake, and intentional fishers of men. And as two women arrived at the empty tomb, may we too worship the risen Savior and run to tell our friends the good news that Jesus is alive. Father, we Pray for wisdom and direction as our district and local leadership engage in calling local pastors and a new district superintendent. Help us to be faithful in our Acts 242 prayer vigil here at Gateway as we pray for the needs in the body of Christ. And teach us, I pray, for how to connect with the lost and the lonely in our community. Keep us focused and diligent to the mission of making disciples of all nations and people. And on this glorious Resurrection Sunday, 
Help us never to forget the sacrifice you paid for our sins. And Father, would you anoint Pastor Wes as he brings the bread of life to us about a transformed heart. May we leave different than we came this morning. And may this be a day of new beginnings of any who are searching for meaning and purpose in life. And Father, for your faithfulness, we joyfully bring our tithes and offerings to you, to the one who loves us the most. And we worship you, and we seek your face for all of our tomorrows. It's in your holy, matchless name we pray. And let the church say, Amen. I buried him. I discovered him. I spoke to him. And on that day, that glorious day, three days after he died, we went to the tomb. And it was empty. empty. I was one of them, you know, a Pharisee. I was an elder, one of the Sanhedrin, appointed to sit as a tribunal and pass judgment against Jewish law. So, when Jesus started coming around, preaching, performing miracles, amassing followers, it was expected that I would fall in line with my Sanhedrin brothers, that I would join them in their distrust of this mysterious man. But the truth was, I was enthralled by him. A man who could heal the lame with his touch? A man who can make the blind see? I had to meet this man, talk to him, learn why God brought him here, and allowed him to perform such miracles. So in the dead of night, I went to him. And do you know what he told me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life! For believing in this man standing in front of me, claiming to be the son of God, I had to know more. I guess you could say we're, we're comfortable. Well, more than comfortable. I suppose well-to-do, prosperous. But that doesn't mean we lived a charmed life. I was, well... Not well, afflicted, distressed. That is, until Jesus came and took all of it away. 
The thing I don't think people realize about Jesus is that he didn't just help the poor. He didn't care about the money or the status. He cared about the people. And when he saw suffering, he did everything in his power to fix it. And what power. He changed my life that day. Not just by healing my mind and my body, but by healing my soul. From that day on, everything changed. The money, influence, it was his. And wherever he would go, I would follow. Now, sure, I'd heard of him. Jesus, that is. I'd more than heard of him. I followed him. Helped him spread his message. Traveled all over. I might not have been one of the 12, but I was there, a true believer. Which is why it was so hard for me when he died. It was hard for all of us. I mean, we dedicate our lives to him, you know? He was the one who was supposed to save us all. And yet, here we are, left behind without him. The Roman soldiers still breathing down our necks. And the Roman leaders still sitting high and mighty on their thrones. We were lost, helpless. We didn't know where to turn. When Jesus died, we all had questions in our minds. How could this be? Where will we turn? Why is this happening? What, what do, we do we do, do now? now? They had their minds made up before they even laid eyes on him. Jesus' followers grew in numbers every day and stretched all over Galilee. They knew they were losing control. I reminded my brothers of the Sanhedrin that a man must be allowed to speak for himself before he is, he is condemned. But the plan was already in motion. The wheels already in motion. When it was done, when Jesus had been crucified and died, I went to him once more. I brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, and together with Joseph of Arimathea, we prepared his body for burial. When we were done, we brought his body to a tomb in a nearby garden. As Joseph and I walked away, I stopped and looked back, wondering, what was God's plan for his son now? I don't think any of us were prepared for what we saw when we went to the tomb. There were other men, women and myself we had brought with us the special spices, preparing to anoint Jesus' body, when right away we noticed something was amiss. The stone, the big, heavy stone that had been placed just a few days before at the tomb was rolled aside. And what's more, Jesus' body was missing. Well, we didn't know what to make of it. Had someone stolen his body? H had someone moved it without telling us? But we didn't have to wonder long, because suddenly, out of nowhere, the a great light shone, and two angels appeared and said, Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? <laughs> Jesus has risen, just as he had said. There was nothing left to do but go and tell the others. I mean, we were in shock. Word was beginning to spread concerning what the women had witnessed at the empty tomb and their encounter with the angels. Now, later that day, I was walking with a friend on my way to a small village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Suddenly, a man came up and began to walk beside us. He asked us what we were talking about. What else was there to talk about but Jesus? Of course, I told him everything, who Jesus was, how he had been captured and crucified, what the women saw in the tomb and how his body was missing. As we continued along the road, the three of us discussed scripture and the prophecies until we reached the village. It was getting late, so we invited the man to stay with us. And that's when everything changed. As we sat for supper, the man stood, he picked up the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to us. And in that moment, our eyes were open. Our hearts were open. The tomb was open. It was him. Jesus. He was alive. alive. Everything he told us had been true. Everything the prophets promised had been, re had been revealed. 
Everything we've been waiting for was finally here. A Messiah. A Savior. The Son of God. Not here to save us from the Roman soldiers. Or Roman leaders. He had come to save us from sin and death. He had come to give us the greatest gift we could have ever hoped for. That all those who believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. On the day we discovered the empty tomb. The discarded burial shroud. Jesus, standing before us, alive once more. Everything changed. For when Jesus emerged from that tomb, having battled death and won, he breathed new life into us all. And our light, our faith, and our hope for a better world were all resurrected. to the 24th chapter of Luke, and we'll join this conversation of a transformed heart. I'm going to let you remain seated this morning because this is quite a lengthy passage, but I hope that you'll follow in your Bible or on your smartphone and uh, be aware of the importance of the conversation that took place after Jesus death, burial, and resurrection. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And listen to the question Jesus asked them. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I suppose if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, we'd probably have most everyone in this assembly to be able to answer affirmatively to this question, how many of you have ever had a broken heart? Many people, maybe most people. Can we leave that door open back there? I hear that thing. <laughs> just, just leave it open. Thank you. Call those repair guys back tomorrow and say you didn't get it fixed. They were here this past week. Oh, we've got it. Wrong. Most people have experienced a broken heart for a number of reasons. Perhaps it's an abrupt, unexpected, severed relationship not caused by death. Maybe it's an unanticipated relocation that contributes to brokenheartedness. It could be from the betrayal of a close friend. And there's even a syndrome called broken heart syndrome that's brought on by chronically high levels of stress. Loss of something very valuable or precious can be a contributor to a broken heart. But for most people, a broken heart is the result of the loss of romantic love. Research has shown that the aftermath of a breakup triggers a series of neural responses in the brain that's similar to the withdrawal of drugs such as cocaine or heroin. Death is also a major contributor to a broken heart. So what do you do when your hero dies? This was the dilemma facing Jesus' followers following the crucifixion. Their hearts were broken and their dreams of nationalistic glory crushed. If you're keeping up with the news recently, maybe you've heard the name Alexis Navalny. When Alexis Navalny died recently in a Russian penal colony, Russia's greatest hope for regaining its once budding democracy died with him. He could have been one of the world's great leaders. He was compared to Nelson Mandela in South Africa. But instead, Putin got rid of the greatest threat to his mafia-style dictatorship by allowing Navalny to die gradually and slowly in prison. Thousands risked arrest to attend his funeral and to protest the regime. They were grieving. When heroes die, we grieve. Something's lost in the world. Something's lost in our own lives. And along with our heroes, something also dies within us, doesn't it? The Roman government seeking to satisfy the demands of the Jewish religious leaders killed Jesus of Nazareth, who was a hero to many of the common people of Israel. Very early that Easter morning, the atmosphere among Jesus' closest followers was characterized by unbelief. They're still trying to come to grips with this. They still can't wrap their minds around this, for he was to be their Messiah. He was the hero to these 11 closest followers of Jesus. They were locked away in fear, self-preservation, fear for their own lives. But a group of women had went to the tomb with spices to anoint Jesus' body. They were unaware of what Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus had already done. And as they were on the way, it wasn't clear how they would complete their mission, for they were asking among themselves, who will roll away the stone for us? But they returned to the inner circle of Jesus' disciples with a stunning story. According to these angelic messengers, Jesus was alive. They had not only been told by the angels, but they were in the tomb because the stone had been rolled away, and they witnessed for themselves that the body that had been laid there in death was missing. But where was Jesus? What happened to his body? 
Luke makes note that the disciples hearing the women's story believed it to be just so much nonsense. I mean, the whole idea that Jesus was alive was simply crazy. The dead don't return to life, do they? The disciples should have recalled instances of the people that Jesus resuscitated from death, Lazarus being the most recent one. And there are at least three occasions in the New Testament of this great miracle, this incredible display of God's power to bring life back to those who were deemed dead. But none of that mattered now. All that mattered to Jesus' closest followers was the fact that he had been murdered and left to decay in a tomb. Having absolutely no idea what had happened to Jesus' body, I surmise that that first Easter evening was characterized by a sense of hopelessness. Hearts were broken. Dreams had been dashed. Luke introduces us to two followers of Jesus from the village of Emmaus, which is just seven miles west of Jerusalem. These gentlemen, one of them named Cleopas, were terribly distraught by the recent events involving Jesus. As would often happen on the dusty roads of Judea, these two followers of Jesus were joined mid-conversation by a stranger traveling the same road. Being prevented from recognizing Jesus, the two continued their despairing conversation. Jesus asked them, what are you talking about? And this is one of my favorite lines in the New Testament. Are you the only one on the planet? Are you the only one in the world that doesn't know what's gone on these last few days? You're kidding, right? Their hero had died. Or accurately, he had been murdered by the nation's religious leaders. The whole situation seemed to have no plausible explanation. Their hopes and their dreams were shattered. Have you been there? Sometimes hopes get dashed, don't they? Dreams get snuffed out. We're left to wonder, what will happen with my life? What do I do now? People are asking, what's your next move? I don't know. There's all the poignant, wistful, bewildered regret in the world and their sorrowing words. These were the words of men whose hopes were dead and buried. And you realize that in the 21st century, all over this planet are people who have no hope, are people who have a false hope. But praise God, there are over a billion on this earth who have a living hope in Jesus. One week earlier, Jesus had ridden in Jerusalem in fulfillment of an Old Testament scripture concerning Messiah, concerning their king. But according to Jewish belief, when Jesus died, he was immediately disqualified from being considered as Messiah. God doesn't die. That was nowhere in the Jewish mindset regarding Messiah. God doesn't die. This man can't be Messiah. God doesn't die. God doesn't lose. Their response to Jesus' question in verse 21 has so much contained within that small phrase, but we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now this word redeem It's found only this one time in the Gospel of Luke, but it's 150 times recorded in the Old Testament. Every Jew knew that to redeem something, you had to pay a price to buy it back. They should have known something about that price because they had just finished with Passover, one of the seven Jewish festivals celebrated every year. And every good Jew knew that at Passover, you sacrificed an animal whose life was given as a price for forgiveness. 
They should have grasped this. They should have understood this. But until they really stood that Messiah was to be the final sacrifice for sin, they could not process that. Perhaps they had never seen John the Baptist pointing out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It wasn't that the Old Testament didn't say it. The Old Testament said it in detail. It was because they weren't interested in believing it because they wanted to reign with Jesus and not die with Jesus. And we're not too far removed from that 21 centuries later. James and John, mother don't you love it when mother shows up? I was watching a great episode of Everybody Loves Raymond the other night. And at an interview, Raymond's brother Robert, mom, had showed up. I got two good boys here, Jesus. One on your left and one on your right when you come into your kingdom. Perhaps that's why their eyes were closed. As to Jesus' true identity. They couldn't see it. Because they didn't believe. In the fullness. Of what the scriptures had revealed. You remember the occasion of the story. There was kind of a tag team match going one day. Pharisees had come to Jesus. They tried to trip him up. Didn't work. Some Herodians came to Jesus. Tried to trip him up. They didn't work. You know. So they go back to the corner mat. And then they tag the Sadducees. The Sadducees are the folks that don't believe in a resurrection or spirits or whatever. And they came up with this cockamamie story about now the law of Moses says. And this was true. What they were saying was true about the law of the Levirate, that, for instance, if my older brother had married my wife, God forbid, and then he passed away, then I would have to marry my wife, God forbid. Uh, no. <laughs> and then if I passed away, oh, she'd get to marry my younger brother. She says, ain't happening. <laughs> and so they came up with the question, Whose wife will she be? And the judge, you ever read this story? Matthew chapter 22, and Jesus said to them, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures? He is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. These closest followers of Jesus were living in a, a darkness, in a, in a haze because of their ignorance of the scripture, they were in error. April 12, 2009, a 39-year-old man stationed himself next to a trash bin at L'Enfant Plaza subway station in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. He simply had on a sweatshirt and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. He was a busker, a street entertainer, familiar to those who frequent public transportation, he opened the violin case, laid it on the ground, seated it with some change. He started to play. He didn't play just anything. He started with a Bach tune. That is one of the most challenging pieces for violin. And he wasn't playing just any violin. He was playing a Stradivarius from 17, crafted in 1713 when Pastor Roger was just a wee lad. So valuable, it had been stolen twice. The violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the greatest. He was an accomplice of the Washington Post newspaper and willingly participated in an experiment. Would the greatest violinist in the world, playing the best music ever written, on the most expensive violin, get anybody's attention at rush hour. But he wasn't dressed in tucks and tails. He had on a sweatshirt and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. What happened? It was three minutes into his performance, and after 63 people rushed by, that one man finally slowed down and looked, but he didn't stop. 
It was six minutes into it before one man stopped, leaned against the wall, and listened briefly. And all over a thousand people rushed by in a 15-minute period without giving any attention to one of the world's great maestros. 27 people threw in change as they were running by. I've played enough music. I know how that goes. He earned $32. Whereas typically he gets a thousand dollars a minute, a thousand dollars a minute, not one person recognized the great maestro. Two people, followers of Jesus, not recognizing the great Son of God. I'll give them some credit. I'll give them some latitude. The sun was setting as they made their trek to Emmaus. They were headed west. The sun sets where? In the west. Dusk darkens the dirt. The mood of the walk is glum. Again, their hero had died. Darkness was falling. Their hearts were heavy. Have you ever left an old friend for the last time at the hospital and walked through the cold rain toward the darkness? It was that mood. Have you ever left the cemetery after laying someone to rest and walking into the lowering of the sun? It was that mood. As far as these two men knew, Jesus' cold, dead body was already decaying in the tomb. End of story. It's quite an amazing thing to consider how one person's eyes are shut and another person's eyes are wide open to see. Consider Oxford University. There's a very distinguished professor there named Alistair McGrath. He possesses three doctorates from the university. <laughs> I'm sure he graduated summa cum laude. I remember graduating laude, how come? <laughs> you know, what a, what a brilliant man. Three degrees in molecular biophysics, theology, and intellectual history. McGrath sees Jesus. He's a believer. He's a defender of the faith. But Oxford has another professor, an emeritus fellow, Dr. Richard Dawkins, a world-famous ethnologist and biologist. He's famous, too, because he sees no Christ. There is no Jesus. There is no God. There is no eternity. There is no life after. There is no heaven. There is no hell, according to Dr. Dawkins. One has eyes open, and the other's eyes are shut. That's amazing, isn't it? But you see, that's the mystery beside you in here this morning. And out there on the street and in the university, that some people's eyes are open, and others' eyes are shut to the presence and the power and the glory of God. The incognito Jesus asked these two gentlemen the $64,000 question, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And I'm sure they're going, wait a minute, wait, 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 Lord, you're, you're throwing us something new here. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets in verse 27, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In reading that great theological commentary Facebook, it is amazing at who folks think Jesus is. He's the Jesus of the progressive left. He's the Jesus of the extreme right. He's the Jesus who wants everybody to have perfect health and wealth and everything is good in this life and nothing bad ever happens. He's the prosperity Jesus. It's astonishing how many invented versions of Jesus there are. The Jews had done the same thing. They had invented their own Messiah, a military Jesus, a conquering Jesus. A Jesus after 
David because Messiah was to be out of the Davidic line, and Jesus was. A Jesus who would give the Jews political freedom from the boot heel of the Romans. He would have a throne without suffering, a crown without a cross, a government without humiliation, power without pain. He was an invented Jesus. This is not the Jesus of the Scriptures, is it, church? It isn't. That's a Jesus from hell. That's a Jesus that the devil wanted to bow down and worship him at the outset of his ministry. Do you remember? Showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All these I will give to you if you'll bow down. Jesus said, no way. Scripture said in Hebrews 5a, who for the joy said before him endured the cross and scorned the suffering and the shame. But what's amazing is that in all of Hebrew history, listen to me very carefully, there is not one, not one rabbi, not one interpreter who interpreted Genesis through Malachi and found a suffering Messiah. There's not one. A throne? Yes. An army? Yes. Victory? Yes. But humiliation? A cross? A tomb? No. No way. According to Hebrews, the Jewish lineage of these interpreters and rabbis. No. Not a suffering Messiah. And yet in Genesis, the Psalms, Isaiah, Daniel, and Zechariah, among others, are recorded prophesied the prophetic sufferings of God's Messiah. You see, the thorn room is the way to the throne room. The cross is the way to the crown. Amen? But none of us want that. Few of us believe that. They didn't want it, and we don't want it. Apostle Paul was one of those rare exceptions, however. He wrote, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And that's where most of us would stop. I'm always amazed that when it's Friday, it's Good Friday, and people are already posting on Facebook and whatever, hey, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Don't rush past Good Friday. Thank God for the resurrection but the death of Jesus on the cross is so important and we just want to rush right by it. Put yourself in the mindset of Jesus' earliest followers. It was bad Friday for him, but good Friday for us. God had to die. But Paul said to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. While Jesus talked, these two men's hearts began to burn within them. God was transforming their broken hearts into burning hearts. They wanted more of this stranger. They still didn't recognize him. Yet he was going on down the road past the village into the night. But they strongly urged him to stay with them. It was late. They were hungry. They all needed to eat. Could he not stay? He consented to stay and eat with them. But hear me this morning. Had they not invited him. He would have passed on by. He would have went on down the road. I did jail and prison <clears throat> ministry for over a decade. And I think of all the songs that we ever sang, the one that the men seemed to sing with the most heart. Men and some of them had been incarcerated most of all of their life. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not. Oh, Jesus, stay. Stay with me, Jesus. Dwell 
with me, Jesus. Teach me, Jesus. Love me, Jesus. Heal me, Jesus. He consented to stay. This wasn't play acting or pretending. He was going on. But they constrained him to stay. Jesus was going to go on unless they made the next step. Dare I say it? It's the same right here. Through the truth of the gospel today, he has drawn somebody, drawn near to somebody in this assembly of people. Something in you has opened, perhaps. There's a sliver of hope. Maybe you're beginning now, you're, you'd be willing to share your heartaches with Jesus and share your broken heart. And from hearing the scripture this morning, it may be that your heart has begun to burn. But the next move is yours. Jesus will draw you, but he does not drive or drag you to himself. Jesus will not force you. He will not over-persuade you. He will not coerce you. Just as the moon's gravity raises the tide every 12 hours, Jesus will draw you, but he will not drive you. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Would you say, Jesus, stay with me? Jesus, dwell with me. Jesus was going on that day because he was a treasure hunter who had somewhere else to go, always seeking out lost treasure. If they did not want him, 3,000 Jews at Pentecost did. If they did not want him, a Samaritan village wanted him. If they did not want him, an Ethiopian eunuch on the roadside wanted him. If he did not want him, Lois and Eunice and Timothy and Lydia and a jailer at Philippi wanted him. And if Western Europe and the United States of America no longer wants him. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that millions of people in Nigeria and Iran and Nepal and Rio de Janeiro and Beijing and a hundred other villages and metropolitan areas, they want him. They want Jesus. You will not thwart him. You will not stop him or prevent him. If today you do not need him or declare that you will not follow him, it breaks his heart. But he will pass on by. He can go right down the street or the avenue or the boulevard, and stop at another day's destination that wants him. And in that house will be joy and peace. In that house will be renewal and transformation. In that house, hearts will be transformed. Jesus can bring eternal life to another house right down the street if you don't want him. But listen carefully. Scripture says, if you hear his voice, hearken unto him, for today is the day of salvation. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, but he's not going to bust the door down. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman, but he's knocking. Do you hear his voice this morning? Do you feel that impression of the Holy Spirit, God? I should offer my life to you today in this place. For there's no better place and no better time than on an Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning, than to yield your life to the claims of Jesus Christ.
I ask you, will you acknowledge your need of a Savior and ask Jesus to stay with you? Now's the opportunity for you to do so. Let's stand together. I invite you this morning to come to these altars if you'd like to pray and just tell the Lord all about what's going on and the fact that you desire him to stay with you and love on you and transform your life. Will you come this morning? coming to worship with us this morning at Gateway. We're so glad that you spent Resurrection Sunday morning with us. Someone invited you. We appreciate that. Maybe you got one of the mailers that went out and you saw it and you have come in response to that. Thank you. We're honored that you're here. If you're in for Easter with family and friends and you've come in to visit, we're so glad that you're here. For those watching online, we welcome you as well. If you're here this morning and say, you know, got some things to think about. I'm not ready to offer my life to Christ. Or maybe you have questions. Maybe you have doubts. That's okay. Just keep leaning in. Keep pursuing. Keep asking. Uh, you know, we've got people that would be glad to meet with you on a weekly basis and sit over a cup of coffee and talk and share. No sales, pitch, no pressure. Just someone to love on you and encourage you as you explore the possibilities of a journey of faith. Father, thank you for this glorious day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who reigns and rules at the Father's right hand in glory. May all praise and honor be unto Jesus today. He bore our sin. He died our death. And God, it's not because anything we have done, but all because what Christ has accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection that we have forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ. Bless all who are here today. Go with us, Lord. May we continue our celebration, Lord, around the table and in family gathering areas, Lord, as we reflect on the goodness of God and the glory of God this day. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Tell someone you love them. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a great day.